Hey guys, thanks so much for joining in today at Men's Leadership Network. I'm so thankful that you're watching today and or listening today, and I hope and pray you'll be encouraged and even challenged today as we talk about change and how to deal with change. And I'm sitting here with Ben Mandrell, and uh, Ben is an amazing man of God, and I'm so thankful that he's with us today, joining us here on MLN. And Ben, thank you. Thanks for being hey, part man, of this. Hey, man, honored to be with you. I love talking to men. Uh, it's, it's awesome. Yeah. So, hey, tell us a little about you. Tell us about where you grew up, your yep. family. Grew, grew up in Northwest Illinois, Midwesterner. Okay. Met my wife at Canacut Camps. Yeah. And she was from Jonesboro, Arkansas. So the North and South collided. <laughs> and we've been in war ever since. <laughs> no, I mean, isn't marriage kind of like that? Yeah. I mean, we uh, clash of culture, North and South, and got married, fell in love, and really have been in ministry most of our lives. Pastored a couple of churches, one in West Tennessee called wow. Inglewood, and then moved our family out to Denver, Colorado to start a church from scratch in 2014. And that was a huge undertaking. Oh, yeah. And was there five years, saw God do some amazing things. But last year, out of the blue, God picked us up and moved us back to Tennessee to lead Lifeway. So it's been a one surprise after another with God. Isn't that how it works? It's always how it works, you know, yeah. especially when you're following and trusting. And hey, tell us about your relationship with Jesus Christ. I mean, like, when did you become a Christ follower? How did all that go down in your life? Yeah, I didn't grow up in a church going home. Wow. Uh, an elderly lady in, a, in this small community had a evangelistic event in her home. It was a birthday party for Jesus, Christmas party, and there was cake. So I went. Yeah. And she shared the gospel. And that was the first time as a seven-year-old boy. I still remember it, Jeff. Like, you know, you hear that, you hear that testimony. My heart was strangely warmed. I think mm. it was Wesley's testimony. And it's just what happened to me. Like, I... I instantly became a Christian and began reading one page of the Bible a day all through my childhood. I don't know why I did that. My parents didn't ask me to do that. Nobody monitored that. I just, I read one page of the Bible every day and wow. I just began to store up uh, a love for scripture. Wow. And so really in my heart of hearts, I'm a Bible teacher. I always will be. I love teaching scripture and particularly love watching it come alive in people's lives. So uh, that's my background. Uh, call to ministry, but really just love working with men. Mm -hmm. And I think what you're doing here is amazing. Oh, man. Well, thanks. Thanks for being a part of it. Really, yeah. really. Hey, tell us, you did, you mentioned it, but about a year ago, you had a big change. Yeah. And uh, here you are pastoring a growing, thriving, exciting church in Denver, Colorado. And then God calls you to this big leadership position. Now you're the president of Lifeway. Tell us about that process. How did that happen in your life and kind of that journey? Yeah, we, we had just moved into a facility. Oh, we started yeah. the church as a Bible study. It's very similar to yours. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it wasn't, it wasn't attractive at first. It took time to get it going. But then when it started to get going, it started to pick up speed. And so in, in four years, we had gone from zero to 1,600. Wow. And God was blessing the church. And I'm not a numbers guy, please. Yeah. But it was just God was moving and people's lives were being changed and everything was growing. We, we just kind of moved into the promised land with a, with a, you know, with moving into a building. It's building. just, it's a game changer. <laughs> yeah. And so we finally thought we've arrived. Yeah. And just as soon as we arrive, I mean, isn't this how the Lord works is he never lets us get comfortable. Wow. And I got a call from Lifeway saying, hey, we, we really think you should consider being the president of Lifeway. We'd love to see somebody who's a pastor, who's from outside the South, come and lead Lifeway into the future. And long story short, 45 continuous days of sleepless nights wow. is what happened for me. And I was surprised by that because 30 days prior to that call, I had absolutely zero interest in going to Lifeway. Oh, didn't yeah. e I didn't even know they were looking. Wow. Uh, I was so focused on my church. Mm -hmm. But my calling stories have been, uh, it's been very abrupt for me. Mm. Uh, even before I went and planted a church, I didn't plan to plant a church. It just, man, God hit me with it. And I knew I was supposed to be a church planter. So that's what happened with Lifeway. So here we are. Wow. Wow. I mean, that's big, you yeah. know? And so today we're kind of talking about change. And uh, why do you think for most men that the subject of change is hard? Why do you think that is? It's difficult to talk about change. Man, I think it's hard for men and women. I, I think <laughs> for everybody, yeah. Change rocks our identity. Mm. I think we get into a place where we take so much identity from what we do. So a change of job is not just changing vocation. It really is, you, you have to get used to a new identity. Wow. So for me, coming out of a pastoral ministry, being on the, in the pulpit every Sunday, being in the center of a community, 
you know, relationally connected, moving to a corporate world, man, it's been, that's a hard transition yeah. because it's so different and it changes your fundamental identity. And so I'm still in ministry. It's just a different kind of ministry. Right. Uh, so I think it, it really rocks your identity. It changes, it causes you to ask, who am I in Christ? Not what do I do for a living? Mm. Uh, and so change, and change always involves grief. Mm. And I don't know that a lot of us know how to grieve well. Wow. Talk about that, because that, that's an interesting point. I, I, I think about that, right? The identity part, I think for most men, we find our identity in what we do as a job. And that's why it's so hard. And then when we lose our job or something, you know, God's spin out of control because our identity ought to be in Christ. But I don't think we talk about the grief part a whole lot. You talk about that just for a second. Yeah, I mean, I would just say to men out there, I think we have a hard time saying I'm not okay. Mm-hmm. I'm really not okay. Mm. Uh, it's a sign of weakness. Or I just feel sad all the time. Mm. I feel down. Um, and that's grief. Yeah. Grief is sadness which is associated with loss. Well, what was lost? So when we moved from here to here from Denver, we lost the proximity of relationships that were dear to us. And so I've, man, I've, I have struggled with waves of sadness. Mm. I've even seen it in this COVID-19 thing where we try to put, we try to look for silver linings all the time in this thing. And I yeah. get that, like we should look for silver linings, but this is just a sad season. Yeah. You know, when you look at the early church in Acts chapter two, they met in one another's homes. They, they met in the temple courts. They feasted in live teaching from the apostles. Yeah. Like, I don't think Luke in chapter 2, verse 49 says, and then a pandemic forced all of them to go into their homes and the apostles could not even come out either. Yeah. Luke would not have said, and this was a glorious time for the church. Yeah. Luke would have said, it was a really sad time for the church, mm. not being together. Mm. And so, I don't know what you're like, but yeah. as a leader, I'm always trying to put a positive spin on things. Mm. And sometimes one of the best things and the healthiest things to do is just to say, hey, it's just a really sad time. Mm-hmm. Uh, and allow the grief process to take place. Yeah. I struggle with that. I don't know about you. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, I think we all do, you know, and I think you're right. When you move from Colorado, you're, you're grieving the, the loss of the church, the, the friendships, the relationships. Now you're going to a new city, you're building relationships, and you've got this new adventure. But, you know, as guys, a lot of times we're off building the career, and then our wives are at home, or our kids are at home, and and they're grieving, right? But they don't have something they're going to. They're now in the middle of trying to, who am I? And so helping them yeah. process that, I think is important too. You know, and you bring up a great point. You know, when one of the spouses goes straight yeah. to work, maybe, maybe it's, the, maybe it's the, the lady, maybe it's the wife. Right. She, she goes straight to a new job and he, he feels kind of lost. Yeah. There's this season of, well, what am I here for? Yeah. You know, what's my purpose? And so the person who goes to the job, to the new thing, actually, I think, oftentimes has the advantage because they've got their work cut out for them. Yeah. And so the, the rest of the family huh. might be reeling in the loss mm. even more so than the person. So I, I think you say it's hard on the family. Change yeah. is hard on the family. Yeah. Oh, man. So how do you deal with that? Like, how, what do you say to men about how do you deal with change? Because... Because a lot of guys watching, I mean, you know, you got new job or you moved to a new house. So you got a new neighborhood, you got new neighbors, you know, or there's a, a death in the family. I mean, there, there's change. We, we live in a world that's constantly changing. How do, we, how do we deal with that? I mean, I don't know how to tell all the men to deal with it, but I can tell you some things I'm learning. All right. Uh, I, I've just learned this year how important it is to have genuine friends mm. that really don't care what I do all day. They don't even understand it. They don't really care. I mean, they want me to do well, but our relationship is not built on work. Yeah. And Jeff, over the years, I've just neglected that in mm. my life. I've tried to always be friends with the people who work for me, which is a good thing. Yeah. But at the same time, you know, work changes and staff changes and people change. And uh, so I, I have realized this year that I've really not been good at pursuing other men. Mm who just love me for me mm. and are, are gonna be there after I change jobs the next time. Wow. Um, and so it's a, I think it's a source, of, a, a source of emotional support that we don't think we need mm-hmm. and we need it a lot more than we realize. Mm. Which is why I love what you're doing, trying to intentionally get men together, mm-hmm. uh, building relationships. We need one another. Oh yeah, oh yeah. And especially in this season. I mean, you go back to what you were talking about with COVID and how it's driven us all kind of indoors and separated. And I think it's weighed on a lot of guys, you know? Um, yeah. And, you know, you're at home now and your family and everybody. And, 
and uh, talked to a guy the other day, and he's like, you know, I kind of need a break. You know? Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. I love my family and everything, but I kind of need a break. I need, you know, and that's, you're like, okay, that's not a bad thing, you know, but, but we do need men. We need healthy relationships right. with other men who say, I get it. I know what you're going through, you know. Um, and there's that power and that encouragement that comes. You know, men love to talk about recreation. Yeah. You know, and the word recreation, if you just look at, break that down, to recreate us. Mm. And I think what we underestimate is how much relationships are recreational. Uh, you know, I know a lot of guys that golf that, yeah. that would say, it's actually not the golf I love, it's being in the golf cart. Yeah. Uh, and when my wife, Lindley, when she goes and sees a friend that genuinely encourages her, and she comes back into the home, She's refreshed. Mm. You can feel it. Mm. And men think they don't need that. They think they just go to their work, mm. come home, spend time with your family. Yeah. I think it's a missing piece. Yeah. I think it's a big missing piece, yeah. you know, and uh, I think you've nailed it. And, and how do you encourage guys to do that? How do you encourage guys to build those friendships or that community? What, what do you say to guys? Well, I think we've got to get honest about the fact that someday we're going to leave our job and somebody's going to come behind us and they're going to replace us and we'll be remembered for about three to six months and then they won't really remember us anymore. Wow. They'll move on. Jeff, it's going to happen here. Oh, yeah. Yeah. As much as you're at the center of yeah. Rolling Hills, someday mm -hmm. there's going to be another pastor sitting there interviewing somebody and he's yeah. not even going to know who Jeff Simmons is. Right. So I think part of it is we have to stop and read the book of Ecclesiastes mm -hmm. about what really happens when we pursue uh, pleasure and projects and professional achievements as, as the, the treasure box at the end of this thing. Uh -huh. It really is the relationships that we form along the way that make life sweet. Mm. So for me, a lot of the time is just, I, I come aware, I, I come awake at the wheel and realize that I'm, I am that guy in Ecclesiastes. I'm chasing something. Yeah. And so I think a lot of men just need to stop and ask the questions like, what am I driving toward? Like, what am I really trying to get after? And if it's not relational depth with God, relational intimacy with others, then what is it? It's probably an idol. Mm. It's probably an idol. Scripture says, little children, keep away from idols. Yeah. Uh, and so we, we all tend to do that. We're idol-making idol machines. Yeah. And so I think a lot of men are chasing idols. I know I have in, in times past. Ministry can become an idol. Yeah. Uh, like anything. Yeah. Well, how do you, in the culture in which we live, because we live in a culture of idols, right? So how do you change in a way to pursue the Lord and not pursue idols? Do you well, see what I'm saying? Yeah, I'm, I'm speaking from a spirit <laughs> of striving and yeah. not from success yeah. right now. Like, yeah, so yeah, yeah. I'm... If my wife were sitting here, she would say, yeah, how are you going to answer that? <laughs> I'm working on it too. So work out your salvation, yeah. you said on Twitter. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think it, I think we need to slow down to speed up. Mm. I think if we look at a lot of the things that we're doing and really measure them according to kingdom measurement, we're, we're confusing activity for accomplishment a lot. Mm. And so I just know a lot of days I come home and I just feel weight in my shoulders. I feel tense. My kids are talking, but I'm not listening. I'm, I'm there, but I'm not there. That's not good. No. Uh, if that's a continual pattern that you're home, but you're not home, you need to be home. Yeah. Which means there's something off with the way you're worshiping acceptance through your work. And I just think, men, we find so much pleasure in winning at work yeah. that we don't pay enough attention to the things that really make life worth living. And we, we get out of balance really mm. quickly. So it's why we need accountability. It's why we need men asking hard questions. Yeah. And we do. And it, yeah, we need people saying, yeah, are you taking that job? Do you want that change because it's money? You know, well, what's that going to do to your family? You know, yeah. well, what's the travel going to be? You know, are you going to be able to be present? Yeah. Because I think as men, we, we kind of chase after those idols. You're right. I mean, it's like, well, they're offering more money or they're offering more prestige or they're offering my career track, but we don't think about what really matters at the end of the day. What does that impact the things that really matter in my life? Man, that's strong. I mean, strong, don't you man. feel a temptation like when you get an email? Don't you want to respond to that email within 30 seconds just so people know you're on top of it? Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, wow, yeah. Jeff is on top of it. Yeah. He's responsive. He's a strong. He must be a great leader. Yeah. Well, if you're always that responsive, if you're always on, mm. there's a price to pay for that. Mm -hmm. And in this always on culture where our phones are always in our pocket, 
it's just addictive. Yeah. I mean, it is a, it is a adrenaline rush yeah. that we just keep going to our pockets when there's people all around the room right here that are wondering why we're not paying attention. I think yeah. that's really happening in a lot of men's lives. Yeah. How do you, how do you say to men and to all of us who are watching, how do you be present at home? And like, like you said, I mean, you could be at home, but you're not present. I mean, you're on your phone, you're answering emails, you, you're really not there. How do, you, how do you encourage men or challenge men in that? Well, first of all, I mean, this, this, this conversation brings condemnation immediately. To <laughs> I mean, for all of us, yeah. Nobody's great. I've not met anybody that says, I figured that piece out. Yeah. Like, it's an ongoing battle. Yeah. I don't think it ever stops. I think there are even, there are even season, seasons where it is justified, where yeah. there's something going on work, and you have to have that phone on. Yeah. But I think, like, here are questions I ask myself. Like, did I have to send that email right now? Yeah. Did I have to, at the stoplight, respond to that text? Like, why did I do that? Yeah. Like, nobody's, like, wondering what's wrong with Mandrell that he waited till the next day to email him back. It really, I think, goes back to managing perception. Yeah. And wanting people to think that we're heroic and we're strong and we're winners and we're not losers. Um, and it just feeds the ego. And I think our ego is always at work with men, especially. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it's identity, right? You go right. back to what you talked about earlier. You're, where's your identity? Where's your identity? So how do you stay grounded spiritually in order to make wise decisions? Because change is happening all around us. We're living in that culture. But we want to change in a godly way. We want to become more like Christ. So, so how do you stay grounded spiritually in order to be able to make changes that are going to lead me more toward Christ? Man, it, it never gets more complicated than going back to the basics. Yeah. Mm. You know, these aren't the most popular sermons, but it really does come back to quiet time, mm. reading scripture, confession of sin, prayer. If you look at seasons of your life where you strayed from God, those things just weren't there. Right. I mean, it, it means not turning the email on till eight. It means getting up early and reading just for yourself. It means cutting out early because you just feel fried. Uh, taking care of yourself is not rewarded in this culture, and taking care of your spiritual life certainly is not rewarded. Right. Nobody applauds you for saying, hey, I needed to take the day and read. Mm. I really needed to just feed my soul. Um, you know, it's the old saying, beware of the barrenness of a busy life. Mm. Uh, and so I think that's what I'm learning. It's paying attention to what's going on inside my body. If I'm always in this adrenaline rush, amped up, trying to win, competing, that's really not godly. Mm. Uh, and so I think it's that, that, that awareness of what's going on inside of ourselves that a lot of men just don't give themselves permission yeah. to, to make those assessments. Wow. That's strong. I mean, it really is, you know. And when we get that anxiety and we get that angst inside of us, I mean, let it spur us to Christ instead of spurring us to, you know, do more activity, to find more identity, you mm -hmm. know. And I think, man, that's powerful. It's powerful. Yeah, thanks. So as, as, as men, right, there is this need inside to succeed. There is this need inside to be the best at what we do. How do you temper that, right? How do you, how do you temper that in order to fulfill the calling that God has for your life? Man, I, th I think you have to realize that whatever you achieve, when you achieve it, it won't be satisfying for long. Ooh. It really is true. Like, yeah. Whether you wanted your whole life to have a certain kind of car, you get that car and six months later, you don't even realize yeah. this was the car you always wanted. It's yeah. just a car. Yeah. Or a nice office or a, a salary. It's, you, you do in your mind think, if I could get there, and then you get there and you, and you realize it's really not all that's cracked up to be. Mm. And so I think, mm. I think some of it is realizing that the world is trying to tell you that happiness is around the next corner, it's around the next promotion, it's around the next recognition, and then you reach that point, and Jeff, it's like a mirage. Yeah. You get there and you realize they, they pushed it out even further. It just keeps moving. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. One of my favorite articles I've ever read is by uh, C.S. Lewis. Yeah. And he, he created this article called The Inner Ring. Have you ever read this? Uh-uh. In The Inner Ring, he, he's talking to a group of college students. And he said, I want to tell you how you can become a scoundrel. Because some of you are going to go on to become scoundrels upon graduation. 
He said, this is how it's going to happen. You're going to go to a place, a workplace, and you're going to start working, and you're going to realize that there's a group of people that have a certain language that they use, and it's collective language. We do this, and we meet on Saturday, and all of a sudden you're going to realize you're not a part of that group, and you're going to want to penetrate that ring. And so you're going to start changing the way you talk or where you show up. You want inside that ring. Well, then finally you get invited inside the ring only to realize that there's a ring within the ring. And then you spend more time trying to get inside that ring. And, and it's an ongoing process to where Lewis says this. When you finally get it, it's like, it's like peeling back the layers of an onion. When you, when you get there, there's nothing left. It's empty. And I see myself in that story, like mm. times in my life where I've just, man, I wanted to be accepted by that group. I wanted to be published by that author. I, mm. wanted, I wanted to be recognized by that mm. significant person. Mm. And there's just not much joy in it. Yeah. And so what, is, what does Paul say? Yeah. Paul says, man, consider others better than yourselves. Yeah. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility, consider others more important than yourself. So, I mean, life really is about helping other people and not just helping yourself. Mm. I struggle with that every day. But man, that is so key. You know, and for guys, I mean, there is this joy when we do help others, you know, and we do see them succeed. And, and yet we're over there chasing that inner circle, right? We're over there doing this. And we're missing out yeah. on just those triumphs of watching our, our kids, you know. I mean, I remember, you know, my kids being baptized. It was the greatest day of my life, you know, watching right. that or, or seeing my kids ride their bikes or learn these things or, or watching people in your workplace succeed, that gives you this great joy that does last, you know? And I think we miss it, right? Because we turn internal, it's like all about me versus I'm going to live for Christ and I'm going to pour into others. Don't you think men struggle with this? As a pastor for 17 years, I yeah. struggle with this. When I would preach a sermon, there was always this one person in the audience that I really wanted to love it. <laughs> and even if 99 other people in the room came and said, that was a great sermon, yeah. if that guy walked by me, for whatever reason, yeah. I felt like it fell flat. Yeah. And I think everybody has like that person, whether it's a father or whether it's a, a friend or whether it's a person in your congregation, that you've just decided they are the ones that are the ultimate say about whether I'm successful. And so each of the churches I've pastored, I've had people like that where I've had to consciously say, why do I care about what this guy thinks so much? I don't know. I just, I respect him and I want him to respect me. Yeah. That game goes on a lot with men. Yeah. And I think we just need to be aware of it. Yeah. Yeah. And what if we could turn our attention to, I mean, like living for Christ versus living for the approval of others. Right. But, but it's such a challenge for us. It is. You know? It is. We want to be respected by respect, respectable people. Mm. We want to be respected by respectable people. I heard Mark Batterson say this one yeah, time. Yeah, 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 yeah. If I have one saying that has informed my ministry more than any others, I really think he's right on when he says, success is when the people who know you the best respect you the most. Wow. So for a pastor, the people who are in his office and around him the most mm. have, should have the highest respect mm. for him. And then it should descend from there. Whereas I see a lot of people, and I've done this before, I, I care more about what t people on Twitter yeah. think about, who've never ever been in a room with me, than, the, than what my own kids think of me sometimes. Wow. And so we just need to realize that that's really messed up. Mm. That's not the priorities that Christ would call us to have. No, no. You know, Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Whatever yeah. you've seen in me, yeah. go and do likewise. He was, he was significantly uh, focused on life on life ministry and he didn't worry about what was going on out there yeah 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 you talk about having a lot of change i mean paul <laughs> was constantly changing his life but he had that center that consistency that i'm living for christ you know and and i think for men i mean i think you're exactly right how do we in the, in the midst of the change around us uh in the midst of things that are going on center our hearts and our lives on christ and living for the approval of God, not the approval of men. Uh, that is, that, that impacts everything, right? The job opportunities that I have, the promotions that I, that I have, the, you know, places to move. You know, I have to filter that is this is what Christ is calling me to, what God's calling me to, versus what I think is going to bring more respect from other people out there. Yeah. That's hard. Don't you think men struggle more than they want to admit with fear? Oh, Yeah. 
Like we don't want to admit it, but we're very fearful creatures. Yeah. A lot of the decisions we make are motivated by fear. Yeah. And so when you talk about change, and the reason a lot of men aren't willing to make a change is because they're ruled by fear. Mm. I mean, when Jesus asked Peter to step out of that boat, walk on the water, there weren't 11 people behind him saying, I want to try too. Yeah, <laughs> they all you know, stay in the boat. We make fun of Peter for his lack of faith, but at least he had the guts yeah. to try something new and yeah. say, hey, God's strong enough to save me. Yeah. And so as long as we live inside fear, there really is no place for faith yeah. to operate. Yeah. So I think growing in our faith means continuously will, we're willing to make major changes. Yeah. And we're not afraid of it. Yeah. Well, I think too it takes being able to pray those things that you talked about earlier, you know, spending time with the Lord so that I do hear God's voice to prompt me to, to change, you know, or to prompt me to move forward. But when, when we are praying and we're living outside of, you know, God's voice, and I do think that we, yeah. we fall into that trap of fear. I think a lot of men deal with insecurity. Yeah. I mean, I really do. I think because we base it on our jobs or we base it on our bank accounts or we base it on, you know, what car we drive or whatever else, and it, it's just it's just wrong, and it, it's fleeting. It's Ecclesiastes, meaningless, meaningless. Yeah. Everything under the sun is meaningless. And how do we as men go, no, I want to base this on Christ? Well, let me ask you. You're, yeah, supposed, yeah, to be yeah, yeah. you're supposed to be interviewing me. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, why did you do it? Why did you leave an established church to plant a church? That's a big risk. It was a big risk. I mean, there's no doubt. And I was scared to death. And the crazy part, and I don't know about for you, but like Lisa, my wife, had more faith than I did. Yeah. I mean, Lisa was like, Jeff, this is what God's calling us to do. We got to do it. And Man up. Yeah. <laughs> it's calling me out, you know. Hey, marry a godly woman, I'm telling you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, it, you know, yeah, because there was that fear of what if this doesn't work? And I don't think it was, you know, money was like, uh, who cares? I mean, you know, but it was really like, is this going to work? Is it not going to work? Is this going to be embarrassing? I'm leaving this place, you know. I, How's this, you know, what are, what are people going to think kind of thing versus, no, this is what God's calling us to. Let's go. You, you know? know, you're really not living in faith if once in a while you don't try something that there's a pretty good chance this is going to absolutely fail. Yeah. <laughs> right? I mean, isn't that a definition of faith? Faith, yeah. I mean, because we don't really want to walk in faith. We want to walk in certainty. Yeah, 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 and if, yeah, yeah. if God's called us to be leaders, which means to be out front, like, there should be some stories where we stepped out. yeah. If there's not a story where you stepped out, you just have to ask yourself, have I ever really been leading or have I just been following? Ooh. Following the money, following Ooh. the comfort, following the certainty. At some point, you just have to say, you know what? I only get one life to live. God's called me to step out. And that's why, I mean, I have such huge respect for what you did. And uh, look, at, look at what God's done here. Well, it's all him. I mean, that's the fun part. And, and I do, I mean, I, I just want to bend because I think you're right on. And guys, I think a lot of times we sit back and let our wives be the spiritual leaders in our home. Instead, we're called to step out, you know, and we're scared to like, hey, guys, we're going to have a family Bible study. And, and we go, like, well, I'm scared of that. So I, would, I don't, you know, or I'm going to pray with my kids, but I don't know what to say. So I'm, I don't, you know, or I'm going to get involved in church or I'm going to go to a community group. But, but we, you're right. We let fear do it yeah. instead of saying, no, I'm going to step out. And I'm going to step into this. I'm going to be the man and be the well, leader God's calling to be. And here, here's where the enemy works against our marriages. He convinces us that it's actually a really bad thing to tell our wives, I'm feeling afraid. Mm. It actually endears your wife to you. You're a human being with yeah. emotion. Mm. And she's not scared of that. Mm -hmm. She actually is grateful that you'd be willing to share that. Mm. And I, I'm learning more and more that it, sometimes it's just me telling Lindley, like, hey, I know I've been stressed. I'm just kind of overwhelmed right now by some fear. Mm. Let me tell you what I'm afraid of because we're always fearing things. Yeah. It's just how we respond to our fear that really dictates the, the path of our lives. How we respond to our fear dictates the path of our lives. That's powerful, because yeah. it really is. I mean, it really is. We should not let fear prevent us yeah. from following God. Yeah. And I have at times. Mm. I've shrunk back when I should have said something. Mm -hmm. I've stayed home when I should have gone. Mm. Uh, and so I, I think, when you look back on your life, you regret more of the things you didn't do than the things you chose not to do. I should have stepped up and tried it. Yeah. Why didn't I do it? Yeah. I had an opportunity. Yeah. 
You know, you can always learn from a mistake. Yeah, yeah. But you got to be willing to make some. Yeah, yeah. That is so true. To the end of people's lives, I mean, that's, that's the thing they regret. It's the, gosh, I wish I would have told them about Jesus, or I wish I would have invited them to church, or I wish I would have gone on that mission trip. I always said I was going to go, and I never did, you know, and I wish I would have done this with my kids, and I, I had this chance, and now they're grown, and, you know, it, I wish I would have forgiven. Yeah, you know, I mean, all these things that, yeah, those are where the regrets come from, you know, but we're afraid to change. Yeah. We're afraid to be honest. We're afraid to be vulnerable. Um, and there was I, a famous nurse named Bronnie Ware who, um, she would minister to people toward the end of their lives. And so she heard a lot of testimonies of, I wish I had done this, I wish I had yeah. done that. She said the number one thing that people regretted on their deathbed was, I wish I had lived the life that I wanted to live and not the one that others expected me to live. Wow. Super powerful. Yeah. When I read that, I thought, I can't tell you how many times I've done what people expected me to do yeah. when I probably should have had the courage to do something else. Yeah. But what do you do? You learn and you start living differently in the future. So be of courage. Paul yeah. would say that to us. Be of courage yeah. as we lead in our homes. Yeah. Man. Hey, what's the best advice you've ever been given? That might have been it right there. <laughs> but uh, man, I, I would say this just as a, as a Christian. Yeah. The best advice I've ever given is invite, your pe- invite people into your life and not to a location. Mm. And I know there's a place for confrontational evangelism. There's a place to walk up to somebody on the street and in a matter of minutes see if you can't get them to. Yeah. That's just not the way God's wired me. Mm-hmm. I have found it to be, with my personality, much more effective to build relationships with people from mm-hmm. all walks of life, mm-hmm. to pursue them, to care about them. And God just always comes up. Mm. Eventually, he's already in the room. Yeah. It's just a matter of when are we going to name him? Yeah. You know, C.S. Lewis said that after his mother died of cancer, that he stopped believing in God, but he was angry at God for not existing. So we don't, we don't ever really get away from God. And I've, what I've learned, Jeff, over the years is my, my most fulfilling relationships have been with people who are far from God. They had no business being in my life, but I just invited them into my life. Mm-hmm. And the end goal was not to try to get them to church so mm-hmm. that Jeff could preach mm-hmm. the gospel to them. Mm-hmm. If that happened, that's great. Mm-hmm. But there's a joy in the journey of just mm-hmm. walking with people. And if we could get everyone in the church mm-hmm. just believing that, mm-hmm. But this new neighbor that just moved in that seems to have no interest in me, how I steward that relationship, it matters to mm-hmm. God. And not just going out on Sunday night for witness training. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Here is a responsibility. God's put this person in my backyard. Mm-hmm. What am I going to do to reach him? Mm-hmm. I just wish the church would begin to rise up and grab that and, and live that way. Oh, man. It would be so much more authentic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it wouldn't create an us versus them. Right. That's not it, right? right? And I think that's churches have done that for so long, you know, and um, turn into a holy huddle and it's us over here and then the world's out there. No, right. it's not. We're all in this thing together. How that's do right. we share the love of Christ, right? So, and the reason I say it's the best advice is because when we have people in our life who are from all walks of life, our lives are more enriched. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I love spending time with Christians. Yeah. But if you don't have any non-Christians in your life, it just, something doesn't feel yeah. right. Right, right. Mm. And that's the fear about pastoring a good church is people can begin to think that all of their Christian life is supposed to be lived inside the church. Yeah, yeah. It's one of the things I appreciate about Rolling Hills. You guys are really intentional Mm -hmm. about pushing people out into the community. It's our prayer. I'm telling you, let's go live it. And we get one shot at it. Let's do it, you know? Hey, what what would you say to guys just to encourage them? I mean, there's uh, all these men who are watching or what do you have any words that you would just say? Yeah, I would, just encourage I would say a couple of things. Number one, I don't know a single person that says they're living their best life right now. Mm. They're leading really well at work. That home is smooth sailing. It's a hard time. Yeah. Uh, it's a depressing time. Mm. Uh, we miss sports. <laughs> <laughs> Hope football's coming back. <laughs> we might be losing the NBA. I don't uh, know. No. Yeah. Uh, we, miss, we miss, like, going and meeting with friends for dinner. Yeah. Uh, we, we miss interaction. We miss fellowship. Jeff, we were able to visit mm. on Sunday, and mm. you guys did a live baptism. Mm. My wife and I looked at each other, and we had tears in our eyes. It was the first <laughs> celebratory live baptism we have seen since COVID-19 hit. Wow. 
And I think it's just okay to recognize that there's, we have lost celebration in our culture right mm-hmm. now. We've lost it in the church. Mm-hmm. And with that, there's some associated sadness. Mm-hmm. And so be kind to yourself. Give mm-hmm. yourself some grace. It's hard to lead at home right now because it's boring. <laughs> it's just boring. <laughs> Trying to figure out what to do every day. Making up the, I mean, if you have kids at home, like, it's just really tough. And so I think part of it is just realize everybody's having a hard time. Yeah. Uh, and, and don't be afraid to admit that. Yeah. Like it's a messy season. Mm-hmm. Uh, so give yourself some grace. Yeah. That's what I would encourage guys to do. That's awesome. Great advice. Man. Yeah. Hey, Ben, what do you want your legacy to be? Oh. You know, I've kind of always seen my life in three concentric circles. God in the center, family in the next ring, and then calling in that outer ring. Mm -hmm. When I'm done with my life, I pray that the people who gather around my casket would say, I lived that way. Mm. It's really that simple, but it's also that difficult. There was no question that God, Jesus Christ was the focus of Ben's life. Mm. It is the number one passion. As the deer pants for streams of water, so his soul longed for God Mm. and he's with God now Mm -hmm. but he man right after God he loved his wife and kids Mm -hmm. he'd do anything for them there was no doubt that he loved them more than his job Mm. that that work was meaningful for Ben but it was a way of providing for his family it wasn't everything to him but at work he cared about people Mm. more than results he cared about getting results through people not just using people to get results Mm what people that like say he was the real deal mm-hmm. like he was just authentic mm-hmm. he cared about me and I'm gonna miss him like, wouldn't it be great <laughs> if when you're gone people say I'm really it's not gonna be the same yeah, yeah. that's what I want that's awesome <laughs> what a great legacy <laughs> what a great legacy oh man I, I pray that for all the guys watching this is great Ben thanks so much hey man it's a joy uh, it's so good Hey guys, let me pray for us right now. So wherever you are, just if you bow your head and just close your eyes, just kind of block out things for a moment. God, we need you. And Father, as men, uh, we deal with change. We live in a world of change. But I pray that God, you have spoken to our hearts today and that our identity would be in Christ and in Christ alone. And Father, we wouldn't live with the life that other people think we ought to live. Yeah. We would live the life you called us to live, Father. We would be the men that you've called us to be. And so I pray for every man watching listening right now, God, that you would give them courage, that you would inspire them, Father, and that, God, they would be men after your heart, and they would love the, their family and love the people around them, and, God, that we would make people better, and that one day, God, when you call us home, that people would miss us, <laughs> you know, that, God, people would just say, you know what, the world was a better place because they were here, and yeah. they lived their life for the glory of God. That's right. And so, Lord, we dedicate our lives to you. Thank you for all your teaching us. Grow us as your disciples, and it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. 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 Hey, guys, thanks so much for joining in today. Be watching every Friday for the Man Minute, and I pray you'll be inspired and encouraged, and then join us again next month as we continue in our series in Men's Leadership Network. Blessings on you guys. Great job, bro. That was fun. (laughs) 